Okay, so um, yeah, thanks for uh, for watching. I'm uh, Snake uh, is uh, my name on the Telegram of uh, Elk Finance, but uh, my real name is Shiloh. Um, it's funny we get tied to these usernames. Um, but yeah, here I'm going to be talking about bridging and the multi-chain future. So, I mean, as sure as you all know, DeFi, decentralized finance, um, is, is full of competing projects, uh, some of which, like Avalanche, have their own blockchain. And so often there's, there's all these new projects uh, with new chains. It, it kind of becomes difficult to keep track of them. But that's kind of what makes DeFi, well, DeFi. Imagine, you know, imagine the choices, they're everywhere. Um, and when we talk about DeFi bridges, um, what we're talking about is moving one asset uh, to another chain. Uh, in the simplest version of a bridge, there are smart contracts on either chain. When a user leaves the chain, they are locking the tokens in a pool uh, on the origin chain, which is technically a smart contract. Um, then when it is confirmed that the user's tokens are locked on that origin chain, um, the, the tokens are um, sent to uh, the destination chain or unlocked on the destination chain, uh, sent to the user's wallet. They're given the same amount of tokens, um, which is ideally worth the same amount. And an uh, there's, there's a, a few different ways um, that bridges work. Um, one other method here is wrapping. Now, with wrapping, uh, what happens is that same first part where uh, you know, the tokens are sent uh, to uh, the smart contract on a single chain, um, and then when they're delivered uh, to the user's wallet, it becomes a wrapped version of the token, not uh, the actual version. So think about Ethereum to Avalanche. Um, when someone sends a token from one chain to another using a bridge, um, the bridge holds the token, and when the token arrives, the wrapped asset is minted or created. And so it's essentially a new token that contains the value of the funds locked on the smart contract that's back on the original chain. And bridges, bridges are a multi-billion dollar industry within DeFi. They hold billions of tokens, like Ethereum, in smart contracts so that users can go back and forth between the chains. This would be referred to as exit liquidity. Now, multi-chain comes with its own headache, many headaches. Getting value and data transferred between unique blockchains is not an easy task. If it was, I, I mean, I guess I wouldn't be here talking about it, as the perfect solution would already exist in terms of bridging. So I do believe that Elk has some interesting solutions to the multi-chain problems. So moving on to the multi-chain future, there will not be one chain to rule them all, at least not forever, even though, you know, AVAX is wonderful. Um, multiple chains will always exist because of how fast this space grows in terms of technological innovation. There's always a good chance that there's an improved version of an idea that already exists out there. And if that idea is indeed better, faster, and safer, um, it makes sense that users might flock to it um, you know, if it gains momentum. Of course, we really know that not all chains are going to make it. You know, um, it's just due to the amount of competition. When we see something new and shiny and possibly more innovative, uh, we know that other projects uh, want to take uh, an interest in there. They see the opportunity for building capital, new tech, and a community. You know, if we were all, you know, uh, to bow to Vitalik and flock exclusively to Ethereum, um, astronomically high gas fees aside, it would be a huge blow to decentralization and what really what DeFi stands for. The more options we have at our fingertips, the safer the space is. We have a lot of different users many, using many different platforms which use you know, different programming languages, different contract structures, different nodes, just within EVM chains, there are these huge innovations. I mean, I mean, look at Avalanche. So 
that, that kind of moves us over to, you know, the problems when it comes to multi-chain. The, the future of multi-chain is, it does come with some, you know, versatility and innovation. But with that comes some pitfalls. I mean, of course, we don't have time to cover all of the problems that may arise when operating in a multi-chain environment. The first of these problems, which may be the most obvious, especially given what I'm talking about, is value transfer. Users looking to explore new chains often have to rely on centralized ex exchanges uh, if bridges don't exist. These are often really slow to withdraw and deposit and sometimes they disable the you know, deposit and withdrawal of certain tokens on certain chains uh, when they're down for maintenance, you know, potentially due to a node upgrade um, um, and it seems like it happens often during a pump. Um, and without bridges, there's really no practical way to move tokens from one chain to another without involving a centralized exchange. And that brings us to data transfer and storage between blockchains. And that's where oracles come in. They're, they're an important role. They have an important role related to off-chain data and databases in the future of DeFi. Protocols like Chainlink, for example, are, I, I think, not used to their full potential. Oracles have some unrealized benefits in terms of a multi-chain future. The point of every blockchain is for its nodes to reach consensus, but it's done in a variety of different ways, of course, depending on the blockchain in question. We've got the proof of work, proof of stake, etc., but that basically only works within one blockchain, not across chains. Now, in order to support transactions uh, that span more than one blockchain, um, we gotta solve that problem again, um, but we have to solve it outside of the on-chain environment. And that's pretty difficult. So it's often attempted with a centralized entity, um, which helps facilitate the interaction, but then the system becomes no longer fully decentralized. So the centralized entity might also have trouble communicating between, you know, let's say EVM and non-EVM chains. It's especially complex um, when you have, you know, more than two chains with differing architecture. So when a user comes to a new chain, not to mention, you know, uh, let's say they come with a non-native token. Imagine USDC.E on, on Avalanche. Um, and, and they'd never been to AVAX before. And, you know, you might not have any of the native token in terms uh, for gas. So that often leaves the user stranded. Um, they need to find a faucet or something else to, to kind of help them out. So there are some advantages of standard bridges. I'd argue that standard bridges work really well, for example, when moving to, uh, through a couple chains, like Ethereum to Avalanche. They're, they're really good for connecting a small number, two to three chains, as there are only a few directions to go from chain A to chain B and back, and you, know, you introduce a third one, and you know, there's one more direction. It's really kind of this N minus one uh, amount of chains is N, uh, and you know, if you add a bridge, they need two other bridges to go somewhere else. Um, also, uh, the simple mechanics. Uh, using wrapping, for example, storing tokens on one side, mint on the other, um, or a liquidity pool solution, having those you know, reserves of pre-existing tokens on chains are simple solutions for value transfer. A, s a single two-way bridge can offer life support to newly developing chains with less market access than popular chains by giving a route in and out. And uh, the bigger bridging protocols aren't necessarily aiming to add these small chains right away. Lastly, um, they're pretty easy to maintain, especially when kept simple. Project system need to make sure that there's enough tokens on both sides of the bridge. But of course, um, they come with some disadvantages as well. Standard bridges are a necessary element in a multi-chain environment. Um, they, they also come with these pitfalls, right? So if you take a look at the image on the right here, you'll see that each chain added to the network has to connect to all other chains. Meaning in this case, if I added a fourth chain here, it would create the uh, need for three more routes to and from every pre-existing chain already in the network. Again, what I said before about this, this N minus one formula. 
Um, it, it can become a development headache as we add more and more and more chains and more and more bridges as each one of the bridges uh, represented by these lines um, drastically increases the development time and maintenance overall. And many of you guys, I'm sure, are aware of the exploits that occur in bridging. The recent wormhole hack happened. Um, that occurred because the smart contract relied on a verification process that had third-party verification. And if you have the same bridge contract on six different chains, let's say, then all six would be vulnerable to the same exploit. If the smart contract holding all the non-wrapped ETH in terms of the wormhole uh, hack, um, the wrapped ETH on the destination uh, chain would become useless because there's no longer uh, enough value behind it to support it uh, when you exit. And with exit liquidity itself, it becomes an issue with complexity. It's impossible to predict which chain becomes hot. Because when many users go to the same chain, there becomes less liquidity available on that chain. So transfers to that blockchain must cease until all others decide to leave the chain and go to others, uh, and, or, you know, or transfer back. Alternatively, uh, the project must refill the smart contract on one side of the chain, which can be, get really expensive over time, especially as we add more and more. Because of the exit liquidity problem, maintaining the bridges becomes an issue. The team is forced to move the exit liquidity around over to ensure, around order to, uh, in order to ensure there's enough exit liquidity on each destination chain, and that, it, and that ends up eating up a great deal of time. So if the bridging approach involves creating a wrapped version of the token, um, like I had mentioned earlier on the destination chain, fragmentation quickly becomes an issue. Um, and there are many popular tokens already on each chain that users would like to bridge. So now um, we have, let's say, two versions of a token with two different bridges if they both use this wrapping approach. Um, think wrapped BTC and REN BTC, which are present on many chains, including you know, the Binance Smart Chain, or I guess they're now BNB Chain. Um, but as previously mentioned, when you're moving tokens from one to another uh, chain you've, you've never used before, chances are you probably don't have gas when you get there, which is you know, forcing you to find a faucet or get a native token uh, sent to you from somebody in a chat, which can kind of get in the way. So that brings us to the current solutions. What do we got? Um, well, we have uh, cross-pollinate and iSwap, and they work similarly to most traditional bridges. When a user moves from one chain to another, they lock their tokens on the chain they're leaving, the bridge unlocks the token on the destination chain. Um, of course, users often run into the exit liquidity problem as, a as the bridge increases in popularity or when there's a rush to one chain in particular. Uh, router and relay, uh, as well as the avalanche bridge, works in a similar fashion, but instead of you know, unlocking tokens um, on the destination chain, they're minted or wrapped on the next chain. So they inherit value from backers who are holding the underlying asset, um, which determines the value. So for every token minted, assets of equivalent value must be held by the protocol so that these tokens can be freely traded on the destination chain. So there's not really a great deal of variety when it comes to existing bridge technologies. Elknet V1, for example, our current bridging solution, is present on 16 different chains, but it'll be deployed on three more as of April 9th when we move to V2. That's Ethereum, Arbitrum, and Optimism. Now, Elknet V1 is our current and soon to be replaced hub of our multi-chain ecosystem. It uses a mint burn function to burn Elk on the origin chain and mint it on the destination chain when the user sends it from one chain to another. Now, the Elk on the destination chain is not minted and sent to the user's wallet until Elknet can you know, verify that the transaction on the origin chain did indeed take place by verifying multiple sources. So there are, I'm sure, multiple solutions to this multifaceted problem. Ideally, each of the items on the list need to be addressed. I'm gonna use Elknet as an example because it gives us some context in looking at reasonable ideas to express these concerns, address these concerns. So nothing else uh, really exists that I'm aware 
uh, to address some of these concerns. Um, ElkNet supports launching on any chain. Every liquidity pool is paired with the Elk token so that there's available liquidity on any destination chain, no matter if it's an L1, L2, or L42. Since what is needed is simply the hub, um, it, it connects bridge contracts from each chain in any language and will be compatible with ElkNet out of the box, sending Elk one-to-one -one between any of the connected blockchains. So basically, you're going to need a decentralized hub that gathers data from and interacts with many different chains. And this also addresses fragmentation. One way to go about this, especially if your project plans to create proxy tokens like we do, um, we need to create smart contracts that allow users to deposit pre-existing assets into a smart contract to hold these alternative assets so they can re receive your asset instead. This is, of course, if they see the multi-chain use case. Now, when designing something like this, you'll likely have to have some free-floating liquidity, meaning that it's separate on each chain, paired to different tokens. Liquidity, in this case, is paired with the ELK token. All ELK is then pegged to a combination of the native chain token um, in one pool, another pool, um, you know, paired to stable coins as well as other popular tokens, uh, allowing us to have the ability to uh, enable some yield, far yield farming over the next three years until all of the ELK token is pretty much minted. Um, and uh, we, uh, of course, you know, we'll know that there's going to be fluctuations in price of the ELK token on many of the different chains. Um, you know, because if, if they're paired to these native chain tokens, they might moon or dump, and that'll affect the price. Um, but for ELK, um, we uh, end up using arbitrage as a function of the market uh, through bots and users um, to sell on one chain where ELK is a higher price. Basically bridge around and buy it on the cheaper chain until the prices even out. Uh, this is uh, kind of a, a means for profit and people aren't really going to turn this down. So the, the center hub doesn't care what kind of language or address format a blockchain operates its smart contracts with. It only needs to check multiple sources on each blockchain. So this solves the problem of chain compatibility because ELKNet aims to be a completely decentralized identity that independently validates transactions. It doesn't matter as long as it can safely determine when to unlock ELK on the destination blockchain and send to the user's wallet. So ease of use, of course, is of the utmost importance. Users need to have a positive experience when using your solution. The ELK token, for example, has the same contract address on all EVM chains, making it easier for the user to identify and ensure they've got uh, the right token address added. The interface needs to be easy to understand, which in this case it is. Um, you know, having enough information to explain what it's doing, but not too much to overwhelm the user, especially those that are new to DeFi. Oracle functions, which would allow the relaying and storage of information to and from multiple chains, is also a necessity. These functions will be offered by ElkNet, um, long about V3, which will allow the dynamic relaying, relaying of information from various blockchains so the data can all be in one place. Uh, this significantly decreased the effort for building multi-chain applications with data from all connected chains. Oracle functions add a great deal of, of the functionality, uh, especially from users looking to analyze uh, data or create unique dApps on any given chain. Security is also very, very important. This hub, ElkNet, uh, is used to connect multiple sources or RPCs and it looks for multiple confirmations that look the same from each RPC from different sources, uh, and it's looking for finality of each transaction to make sure that there's no room to exploit it. Each chain has its own block times and amount of confirmations that are deemed safe or final, uh, so that must be analyzed as well to ensure that it, it, the likelihood of an exploit is uh, low. And that, of course, is taken into account. So what's next? Well, 
In order to be fully decentralized, the community must be in charge of the central hub's transaction verification process. It could be done through a simple proof of stake mechanism, which is what we're going to be using. In the case of Elknet, users uh, running nodes must put up a significant amount of their ELK in, a, in order to be able to validate transactions from chain to chain. They'll earn a portion of the fees in the ELK token from each cross-chain transfer, incentivizing them for running the validator nodes. If they're found to be making mistakes with their validators, uh, they'll lose some of what, they have, what they've staked, just like traditional blockchain validators. Um, we also look at our stablecoin. It can be an integral part of any project, but there's so many out there. Uh, that's where it's kind of difficult to be innovative. So we've got a fully backed, over collateralized stable co coin that's coming. And in, in this case, it's uh, going to be based and pegged uh, to the Swiss franc, which will be mintable through over collateralization on each chain natively. So it will also contain the functions of the ELK token, uh, using it uh, for arbitrage um, and regular buying and selling, setting it across chain just like the ELK token. So our SDK, our software development kit, is a necessary part of any hub. Um, if you want further community development, bridging as a service in the case of ELK means the user can create a proxy token to their liking as long as they own a loose NFT. The SDK will allow developers to tweak the properties of the proxy token to their liking, um, stake their Moose NFT, and view and manage details related to the project's infrastructure as it relates to ELKnet. So the project does not even have to use the ELK DEX, ELK's native exchange that is present on all chains we deploy on, to provide liquidity from their token. You could effectively put it anywhere. So in this way, Moose become um, a ticket for a user to create a single uh, proxy token that represents another um, by staking their moose on where, whatever chain they own the moose on. This allows them to take a token from any chain we're on, shoot it across ElkNet. As long as they've added liquidity, they can become multi-chain too. Um, and a small amount of Elk would be um, you know, burned and a uh, very small fee would be used in Elk um, to reward the validators. Um, this is essentially a paranode, um, you know, which, which uh, kind of gives the users uh, the ability to utilize Elk for a cross-chain as a service, which is, which is pretty neat. So, and of course, lastly, you'll need a, raised, a way to raise liquidity for new chains. Uh, Moose NFTs do that for us. Um, each uh, 100 Moose NFTs sold on each blockchain that we deploy on uh, help us get liquidity for the next chain we launch on. Okay, so the future is gonna be multi-chain whether we like it or not. The vast amount of competing chains create innovation and growth within DeFi. Multiple options on multiple platforms is what, is what makes DeFi completely, truly decentralized. A multi-chain ecosystem is not without its challenges. And some of these limitations are related to data transfer between blockchains, complications around consensus between chain, chain compatibility, especially when trying to, to connect more than two chains, and users lacking the native chain token for gas when arriving on the new chain for the first time. Now, because of the emergence of multiple options in blockchain technology, bridges are a necessary tool in DeFi. Standard bridges have limitations when it comes to addressing many of the multi-chain problems such as connecting multiple chains together as the amount of bridges increases in a network uh, of chains by n minus one when adding a new chain. Now, that causes increased development and maintenance time, and it takes some time to manage these things. Now, we have to look at communication between EVM and non-EVM, especially when there's more than two chains, addressing security issues, remaining decentralized, and those exit liquidity concerns. Now, a central hub solution that addresses these concerns, much like ElkNet, is a viable solution to address all of these problems. Since you've got a central hub, there's only the need for the hub to communicate with each chain individually, avoiding maintenance and scalability problems. The hub can use nodes and proof of stake to maintain security when validating transactions and use multiple sources to validate transactions on each unique blockchain. 
being that it's a central hub, there's no issues related to adding non-EVM chains as well, um, as the hub simply needs to verify transactions and addresses, which can be done uniquely depending on the primary language of the chain. Exit liquidity becomes a non-issue because of the free-floating liquidity, incentivizing, incentivizing users to arbitrage and equalize the price when tokens on various chains differ in value. Fragmentation is addressed as well, since a single wrapped asset on multiple chains makes sense. Uh, so if users decide your solution is better, they can lock many different versions of a wrapped asset into a smart contract and essentially swap for the multi-chain asset offered by the hub, in this case, Elknet. Lastly, features can be offered um, to swap a token for the native asset on the destination chain, much like we do, where you can sw swap one elk for gas on the chain you're arriving on. So if they have gas, um, when they've never used the chain previously. Okay, I think that about covers it. I was, <laughs> just thought uh, I have time quickly a minute for any questions, if there were any. Cool, okay, well, that's good. It means I did a good job explaining. I'll, I'll take it as that. So yeah, thanks everyone. Thanks. I wish my voice was not so messed up. <laughs> it's so bad.